How can pornography impact you, your loved ones, and the world around you? Discover the answer for yourself in our free three-part documentary series, Brain Heart World. In three 30-minute episodes, this docuseries dives into how pornography impacts individuals, relationships, and society. With witty narration and colorful animation, this age-appropriate series shines a hopeful light on this heavy topic. In each episode, you'll hear from experts who share research on porn's harms, as well as true stories from people who have been impacted personally by pornography. Stream the full series for free or purchase an affordable screening license at brainheartworld.org. My name is Garrett Johnson, and you're listening to Consider Before Consuming, a podcast by Fight the New Drug. And in case you're new here, Fight the New Drug is a non-religious and non-legislative organization that exists to provide individuals the opportunity to make an informed decision regarding pornography by raising awareness on its harmful effects using only science, facts, and personal accounts. We want these conversations to be educational, uplifting, and hopeful as we sit down with experts, influencers, activists, and people with personal accounts, we cover a wide variety of topics that may be triggering to some. You can refer to the episode notes for a specific trigger warning. Listener discretion is advised. Today's episode is with Christy Wells. Christy is the co-founder and CEO of Safe House Project. Safe House Project is a nonprofit that fights to eradicate child trafficking. During this discussion, we talk about the realities of sex trafficking, survivor empowerment, and what we can do to help in this fight. With that being said, let's jump into the conversation. We hope you enjoy this episode of Consider Before Consuming. We are glad you're with us. We are fortunate. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. I think it's a funny thing that we should probably mention to the audience that we've had many challenging times. (laughs) In arriving and having this conversation. Yes. One of the funny things is that I had to bail on the conversation. So I postponed it a week and then I mixed up my calendars. And then I said in an email to Christy and the one of the other co-founders, Brittany, I was like, when it rains, it pours. And then we scheduled another date to record and it actually <laughs> rained. And we couldn't record because it sounded like someone was popping popcorn in the audio. <laughs> uh, but the, the irony. If you, at first you don't succeed, try, try again, right? Yep. And here we are. We made it. <laughs> we do it right because we do it twice or three times. <laughs> or three times. <laughs> well, again, Christy, we are thankful for your time. We know you are you know, a busy individual. And uh, we're excited to have this conversation to learn from you and learn more about Safe House Project. Um, In regards to the other co-founders, I mentioned Brittany's name briefly. Is there anyone else that we should acknowledge as we start this conversation? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, When we began, our organization was actually birthed out of an initial um, endeavor, I'll say, to fund a safe house in South Africa that a friend of ours, Nigel Anderson, or his hip hop artist name is Legend, Uh, began. And he went to South Africa, saw a need to build up a safe house, and came back to the United States, launched a hip-hop album to raise money to build up the safe house. And so we jumped in to support that effort, and then Safe House Project began to grow into what it is today and began to have a domestic focus. But Legend, or Nigel Anderson, is one of those that we always attribute to being a a co-founder in Safe House Project. Oh, cool. He's awesome, and he is somebody that you t- should totally have on your podcast because he has a really passionate story about kind of his overcoming his addiction to pornography and what that has done to lead into the work that he does now. So super cool individual, uh, amazing story. Okay, cool. We'll have to have him on. So, and his name's Nigel or Legend? Nigel. Yep, Nigel Anderson. Legend is his hip hop artist name, so it's Nigel spelled backwards. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> but um, well, yeah, N- he's awesome. Nigel, uh, this is your official invite. If you ever listen to this episode, we want you on yes. the podcast. So I'll, I'll email you. Um, but in regards to your background and how Safe House Project became a thing, can you talk to that a little bit more? You mentioned that you were on. I guess Nigel's the one who wanted to create a safe house in somewhere in South Africa. How did that all come about? 
Yeah. So as a hip hop artist, he went to South Africa uh, to perform with a number of artists from his label. And while he was there, he was with our friends, Marsha and Jenny, who run Curious Global in South Africa, in Soshinguve, South Africa. And they, he said, what's next? What are you think? What are the things that you need? And they said, we really need a safe house. We've got girls who are being trafficked or at risk of trafficking, and we need a safe place that we can protect them and give them hope and healing. And so he just came back from South Africa with his heart on fire and heartbroken and said, what can I do? And so he, like I said, pulled together the artist to launch this album. And I had kind of known in my heart for a couple of years that there was something funny enough that I needed to do an anti-trafficking and something I needed to do to support his label. And so when those two things merged into one project, I said, I don't, I'm in, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm in. Wow. And so um, I had a background in PR. And so I jumped in, I ran the launch of the album uh, from the PR side. But as we kept doing this, people kept saying, well, what are you going to do domestically? And Brittany uh, had actually understood trafficking more from the domestic side. She had seen it as a military living in the outskirts of Fallon, Nevada, lived down the street from the Madam of the Brothel because trafficking, or I'm sorry, uh, prostitution is legal there. But they were seeing these brothels recruit girls out of the high school. And so she saw this intersection of legal and illegal industry. But she understood what it looked like, and she'd worked with a restorative care program that provided really that hope and healing to survivors stateside, like what we were looking to see done internationally. And so we began trying to come up with an answer when people would say, what are you going to do domestically? So to do that, we became students of the domestic landscape of trafficking. We really wanted to understand it. And at that point in 2017, the Department of Justice was reporting that about 300,000 American kids are trafficked for sex in the United States every single year through prostitution or pornography. But then we realized that only victim identification was only at 1%. And then we realized that without a safe place to go, once those 1% were identified and helped to exit their trafficking situation, 80% were ending up back in traffickers' hands. And that was where we realized we could have the ability to make a difference. So we set out on the mission to increase victim identification through true education above so that we could get that number above 1% and to increase the number of restorative care homes in America through funding and through mentorship. So we don't operate any of the safe houses, but we fund and we mentor those because when we began, there were only 100 beds. So to date, we've helped add over 174 beds through new or expanding restorative care homes across America. Wow. When you say 174 beds, I don't think that's anything to sneeze at. Like, it's easy to breeze over that number and be like, oh, it's 174. It's not that much of a, it's like not that big of a number, honestly. But then you think about right. what are you, like all of the work that those 174 beds represent. And then you start to realize like, wow, that's, that's a big deal, man. Right. And every bed is multiple lives changed over the course of a year. Right. So that is where you are getting every bed because we quantify it by beds because some safe houses have 12 beds and some have four. Right. And so we can't quantify it by the number of safe houses that we help open. But yeah. each bed represents an individual and yeah. life changed. And it's that, you know, that starfish analogy of the little boy walking on the beach that's covered in starfish and he keeps picking one up and chucking it in the water. And one by one keeps doing it. And the man comes up to him and says, what are you doing? You're never going to make a difference. The little boy picks up another starfish, chucks it in the water and says, made a difference to that one. <laughs> yeah, that's a beautiful thing. And it's, you know, kind of the, the same idea in the work that we do here is every single bed is a life transformed through restorative care, through all of the different services that are provided in a safe house. Yeah. That's a beautiful thing. So first of all, when I go to your website, safehouseproject.org, one of the first things that I noticed is the logo up in the top left. Can you talk to that a little bit in, in your mission statement? Yeah. 
So our logo is a square and most people who see it don't know what they're, they're looking at. Um, but it is actually a symbol that was used during the Underground Railroad to indicate to those escaping slavery when they'd finally reached a safe house. So for us, we replaced that center of the square with a keyhole. But um, the original way that that looked was there would be a color in the center, a red or a yellow or a black. And whatever color was in the center indicated really where somebody was on their pathway to freedom as they were following along the Underground Railroad. So yellow, which was the original color of that center for us, was think of it as like a yellow, um, uh, the warmth of a hearth, uh, of a fire. Mm -hmm. That kind of yellow indicated to somebody that they had reached a safe house. And if anybody who is listening for some crazy reason knows anything about quilting, <laughs> then they know that the symbol actually is the log cabin pattern that was used during... Um, during that time frame. And so that this was displayed as a symbol through quilts that hung out on the line. Oh, wow. And so the log cabin pattern is still used today. My grandmother was a quilter and I have a quilt handmade um, in the log cabin pattern. But what we didn't know is that at that point, those were being used to guide somebody's path. And so that means a lot to us. We know that uh, it took a lot for, um, those escaping slavery then to make that journey. That was a hard, arduous journey. And it still is hard for survivors of trafficking who are escaping. Um, and we know that it takes a lot of bravery to enter into a safe house program, but we also know the hope and healing again that comes from that. So the safe house project mission is really twofold, to increase victim identification above 1% and to increase the number of restorative care homes ultimately empowering the survivor's path to freedom. So we do training and education. We train law enforcement, we train military, we train first responders. Um, I actually had the opportunity to train the entire USS Theodore Roosevelt a couple of years ago prior to uh, a deployment. So 5,000 sailors, um, that was exciting. But That's we, really cool. Yeah, it was uh, it was a lot of fun, and as a military spouse, I, I appreciate just the heart that so many of them have to see this issue for what it is. But we train community members. We have uh, an on watch or a training that we did with the Maloof Foundation, and we have a brand that we launched together called On Watch. And if you go to IamOnWatch.org, then you can see the training. That is a free one hour training that was developed with survivors uh, to help people understand how to spot report and prevent trafficking where they live, work and play. And so that training was, it's all video content. It's 10 five minute modules, but it helps people really understand what trafficking looks like. And that's because it was survivors who shared their stories of what happened to them. Not necessarily the horrific things that happened behind closed doors, but their intersection points with community members and how people could have seen something and responded. Um, so that is a really powerful way for people to understand what trafficking looks like. Um, with our survivor empowerment, we also help survivors escape and help them find uh, that restorative care that they need. And then we also, as I mentioned, we help fund and mentor the launch of the safe houses. So those are kind of our three different buckets where we focus. Okay, so education, survivor empowerment, and safe housing. And um, so jumping into the education a little bit more, you mentioned on watch. Yeah, we encourage those who are wanting to learn more about sex trafficking to go check that out. Now, you've mentioned victim identification being, you said, less than 1%? Around 1%, yes. When you say victim identification, I don't know if you're referring to the victims themselves identifying as a trafficking victim, like understanding that they are being trafficked? Or are you saying like those who are not in the life of sex trafficking identifying victims? Does that make sense? Yeah, it's actually a little bit of both. Um, really, it's that those who are being trafficked, only 1% is ever identified. And also, I'll, let's correlate identification to... Um, given that initial support. So if it's a child trafficking victim, 
that is identified, then there's immediately support services that come alongside. So okay. then help them exit that trafficking situation. So we'll, we'll say that 1% also equals escape or rescue. So really only 1% is ever identified or, or rescued. Um, now, survivor self-identification can also be a piece of that. Now, those numbers, I would, also, I would argue, are even less than 1% because of the trauma bonds that are established that survivors sometimes have to be out of that life for quite some time before they truly grasp anything that was their sex trafficking situation. Yeah. And how many people have taken your courses? How many people have you trained to identify victims, to report, to know what to do? Well, through On Watch and then through our in-person trainings and also through our corporate trainings, we develop specific trainings for corporations to understand how to spot trafficking within their specific business models. So one example of this is we develop training for the entire pest management industry. Uh, one of their leaders came to us and said, we've got 160,000 pest technicians who go into 20 to 30 percent of homes in America. And how incredible oh, wow. would it be if we equipped them to spot trafficking? So we deployed training to them and that's been adopted. But collectively, we have educated over 200,000 people in the last three years. Wow, that's amazing. It says on your website that you that Safe House Projects works with 82 corporations to effectively identify survivors and invest in their future. And I know that, you know, as a nonprofit, it sometimes it's hard to keep up on all those numbers that are displayed on websites. Is that number pretty pretty accurate? Are you are you guys currently working with about 82 corporations to to educate them? I would say so, and that's all at varying levels. So those could be corporations or smaller companies who have adopted the on watch training and rolled those out rolled that out to their employees that could be a large fortune 500 company that's rolling it out we have a new corporation who's coming online who is rolling out the training the on watch training to over 500,000 employees worldwide um, but yes those are that's about 82 different corporations that we are working with at varying levels who um, through their partnership with us do work to train their employees on how to spot trafficking Awesome. Does Safe House Project work um, with work internationally with victims, or is the focus here domestically? Because I've heard a little bit of both throughout this conversation. Sure. Our primary focus is domestic. Now, with that, we have some things that we are working on. Our partners in South Africa, we still support that effort uh, and still support the development of those safe houses. And so so that's just always been kind of our cornerstone mission. So we've kept that specific organization as a funding recipient. And we are working with them to develop a curriculum that will deploy uh, really across the globe on increasing survivor identification through education. But it's integrating into a curriculum that they are currently building out called Courage to Care. And so that is um that's probably where most of our international focus comes in is again partnering with another group who is working to increase victim identification but when it comes to survivor care our focus is domestic oh, okay as i was doing some preparation for this conversation i went to polaris project they estimate that there are 25 million people trafficked worldwide the 25 million mentioned by polaris project that's uh, trafficking, generally speaking, not just specifically sure. sex trafficking. Um, but you mentioned 300,000. Can you talk to that number a little bit? Sure. So that is a number that was, the 25 million is uh, human trafficking overall. So that includes labor trafficking, organ trafficking, um, all of those different, sex trafficking, all of those different elements. They estimate that about 4.8 million people are sex trafficked globally. But the 300,000 number is actually a number that was released by the Department of Justice in 2017. And that was their best guess at the number of American children that were being trafficked for sex in the United States every single year. Now, I will be quite honest that they have since rescinded that number. And part of that is due to the fact that this is an illegal industry. And trying to pinpoint the numbers behind an illegal industry are very difficult. Uh, the one thing that is, I feel like, a very solid, accurate representation of 
the scale of this issue is that it is a $99 billion industry. And that does feel like a more tangible, um, quantifiable data point because we can track the, the money. Yeah, I can understand why you say that. At the same time, to me, $99 billion is, I can't comprehend right. it. I mean... So it's it's like, whoa, that seems... Wow. Right. So as a military spouse, because one day I was like, I'm trying to wrap my head around how much this actually is. So Northrop Grumman is a one of our largest defense contractors. They build the planes my husband flies. They build, you know, help support the building of aircraft carriers and all of that. That is a $33 billion corporation. And so you think that one of our largest defense contractors, this industry is three times larger. Yeah, that's that's hard to comprehend. If we look at your numbers, uh, the number, some of the numbers that are highlighted on Safe House Projects website, um, like we mentioned, the eighty-two corporations, the hundred and seventy-four beds that have been provided. You know, it's a it represents a lot of work, a lot of effort, and then you start to look at these numbers. You know, the the number you mentioned, the estimated three hundred thousand children trafficked it within the United States, and uh, you just realize how much work we have to do. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It seems like Safe House Project has broken this fight into three areas. It's education, it's uh, survivor empowerment, and it's safe housing. Correct. Yeah, those are the three pieces. You know, this issue can be tackled from so many different ways. And that's where we are so grateful for so many of our partners in the fight who do focus on attacking it from the demand side, you know, working to reduce the demand like you guys working our partners who work on the legislative side who work to ensure that there is legislation that can support survivors or those who are tackling it from the law enforcement side there's so many different ways that this thing has to be attacked but the three key areas that we do focus on are like you said education and survivor empowerment and safe housing and i think it's important as we go through this i kind of wanted to break it down into those three parts education survivor empowerment and then safe housing Um, jumping a little bit more into education i think that there's certain myths that are common when we are talking about sex trafficking and so i wanted to address three of those and kind of get your perspective on them Um, the first one is that only girls or women are victimized right and that's a common misconception um the reality is boys are trafficked now the data behind it i I will tell you that I have seen solid data that says it's one in 10. There was also a report produced by the Department of Justice in 20, I believe it was 2019, that said it was upwards of 36% of trafficked individuals are boys. Now, and that was specifically for sex trafficking. Now, which one of those is correct? I honestly couldn't tell you. I will tell you that victim identification of boys who are trafficked is lower than that of girls and that survivor resources for boys who are trafficked is substantially lower than that of girls but we do know that boys are trafficked and it's you know sometimes we see it in different parts of the country more than others but it is absolutely a population that is trafficked because ultimately traffickers are exploiting the vulnerable and so it is a supply and demand issue, and there is a demand for boys. There is one program out of Atlanta that is um, center for Wellspring, and they launched an emergency program for minors. And so they actually retrofitted an old uh, correctional facility for minors, turned it into dorm style living, and. In that, I believe, I'm hoping I'm going to get these numbers right, I believe it was serving eight boys, eight girls, and four transgendered. Now, I think they are still ramping that up. They just launched last year, right at the start of COVID. I believe it was last February or March. But, so I think they're still ramping up all of those that they're supporting. But they they are one of the programs that we've supported that does uh, have services for boys there is a program that is not one that we have helped launch but does exist it's the only long-term restorative care home that we know of for boys and that's down in florida but this year we do have a program that we are supporting for those age 18 to 24 that are male 
and that one is going to be in Texas. Now we do have others that we're mentoring that are looking to launch programs for boys because they recognize that it's a gap. So we're working to get the industry caught up by pointing out that that is a gap. So when people come to us and say, I'm looking to launch a safe house, we say, great, here are all the gaps in the national landscape. Which one do you want? And so we're excited to see people really stepping into that. Yeah, that's great. The second myth that I wanted to get your take on is that human trafficking always involves moving or traveling or transporting a person across like state line or international borders. Right. Can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, a lot of times people confuse the idea of human trafficking with human smuggling. And what you just described is really human smuggling. But sex trafficking is the commercial sexual exploitation of an individual through force, fraud, or coercion. And that commercial sex can be prostitution or it can be pornography. But if a child is being sold for commercial sex, again, prostitution or pornography, then that is considered trafficking. You do not, because the child's inherently vulnerable. So you don't have to show that somebody has been vulnerable and has been um, forced into something or, you know, that it's taken force, fraud, or coercion. If they're, you have to prove that if they're an adult. If they're a minor, again, you don't have to prove force, fraud, or coercion. But it's ultimately, at the end of the day, it's somebody being sold for sex. And the challenge of believing that sex trafficking involves moving a person is that if that's the perception that we continue to operate under, then we are going to miss the 40% of child trafficking victims who are trafficked by a family member or those who are human sex slaves in their own homes um, or being trafficked by their friends, but they live at home and their family doesn't know it. And so we are missing the opportunity to spot those that are in our communities that are being trafficked if we consistently believe that it looks like Taken, um, the movie, or it looks like, again, human smuggling. As you mentioned familial trafficking, you cut out for one second. I know that you're, we talked about how you're running this off of your phone, so maybe there was a little bit of (laughs) blip. Can you talk to that again? Um, What was it, a number that you included? You said we were going to miss this. Yep, it's 40% of child trafficking victims are trafficked by a family member. And so if we believe that trafficking is only involves moving a person, then we're missing those kiddos that are being trafficked by a parent or an, a grandmother or an aunt or an uncle. We had a survivor come into care. She was one of the very first survivors we ever got to serve, and she was 13 when she came into care. But she had been trafficked for three years by her grandmother. Her grandmother had pulled her out of school when she was 10 years old and began using her as the family source of income. But when the grandmother had pulled her out of school, school didn't think anything of it, even though this little girl's mom had been drug addicted and STD ridden and they kind of saw her as a prostitute. But they never thought that, you know, people just, don't imagine that a family member could traffic somebody. So if we are only looking for, again, something that looks like Liam Neeson's taken, then we're missing those kiddos that are in our own communities that we have the ability to help. Yeah. Thanks for repeating that because I didn't catch it. Um, The third myth that I wanted to address is that individuals in the life of sex trafficking are always physically locked or held against their will. Can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, let's be clear, that happens, but it's not the most common. So 66% of trafficked individuals are trafficked by somebody they know and trust, you know, including that 40% of familial trafficking. And the way that the traffickers hold them captive is not chains or metal links, but it's trauma bonding. It's convincing them that they are loved, that they are going to be taken care of, that this is normal, that this is, you know, what their and their bodies are intended to be used for. Whatever the, the lie is that they tell them, they use trauma bonding tactics to keep the trafficking victim from ever speaking out from ever saying that they need help. And that person feels like they are completely enslaved. 
And survivors tell us all the time that shame was the thing that held them captive more than anything else. Oh, wow. Interesting. If you go to, you know, that second, the, the second pillar in your three, or I guess the second thing that you guys focus on, the survivor empowerment, it seems like the job of the trafficker or the job of the pimp, whatever you want to label that individual, is the exact opposite. It's survivor disempowerment. Exactly. Exactly. And they tell them that they have no value, that they have no worth, um, except what dollars are associated with them. And the longer a girl is trafficked or a boy is trafficked, the more they believe that lie. And breaking down that wall of lies is hard. Yeah. And we'll talk more about that as we go into the survivor empowerment portion of the conversation. But I wanted to ask you uh, about vulnerability. You mentioned how, you know, boys are can be just as vulnerable as girls. And I wanted to ask if there if there's uh, certain groups that are at higher risk for falling victim to sex trafficking based on vulnerabilities. Sure. So you are going to see more African Americans that are trafficked, absolutely, or those who are lower income, those who are uh, LGBTQ. But the reality is anybody, any age, race, socioeconomic status, gender can be trafficked. Right. We've talked about what those who are trafficked look like and some of those stereotypes and the myths around Mm -hmm. that. What about the buyers? Mm. I think that there's also stereotypes around who is buying. And I think it might be important to address that. And and when we're talking about the education portion, who who are the buyers? The buyers are all demographics. They are wealthy men. They are poor, you know, men on the streets. Um, the, uh, they're women, you know, they're old, they're young. Um, there is no one size fits all when it comes to the profile of a buyer. Yeah, that makes sense. And I just want to state, you know, for the record, to be clear that I don't think you or I or either of our organizations are suggesting that if you consume pornography that you are going, that's going to lead you to purchasing, you know, engaging with sex trafficking. Correct. Um, that, that doesn't happen for everyone, right? right? And we're not trying to, we're not trying to fear monger here and say that this is going to be you if you walk down this road. But I think it's important to talk to these realities. Right. And, and really what we know is that about 80% of the survivors that we've surveyed have said that the buyers have come to them and uh, with pornography and things that they want them to reenact and so there's there's a connection to it but that's not saying that those who watch will do will purchase um but we know that there are absolutely connections between trafficking and and that industry we have uh, survivors who are on staff with us that had been in the porn industry um, that really can point to how, like, even at certain points, they felt like they were, you know, making that decision for themselves. But at certain points, it did transfer over to uh, really being trafficked and not having control over what they were doing. Right. Well, moving along in the conversation to survivor empowerment, I think this is something that is misunderstood. I think it's often what's the term? It's often, uh, I don't think people understand the depth of how much is required to help an individual exit the life of sex trafficking. I guess the term is oversimplified. People think it's a simpler process than it is. And so can you talk to all that is required to help an individual become empowered as they exit the life? Yeah, I I think, well, let's first hit on the basic needs, right? Those are the easiest ones for us to wrap our head around. They need medical care. They need uh, dental care. You know, they need basic food, shelter, clothing, those basic needs. 
those things that are in the hierarchical of needs, the things that we know we need first to make us feel secure, taken care of. Right. So those are the first things that you're going to see in restorative care. And those are the things that begin to build trust. You know, when somebody is, and honestly are just desperately needed, you know, for survivors who like the little girl who was trafficked from 10 to 13 by her grandmother, I promise you, nobody was taking that little girl to the OBGYN or to the dentist or even care that she brushed her teeth. And so those are immediate things that have to be taken care of to just for the health of the survivor. But the mental trauma is so substantial. And that is where they need so much of the, the care and the hope and the healing. And so they have to have therapeutic services. They, that's where they get group therapy, individual therapy. They need to understand the trauma bonds that were built around them in order to know how to break them. They need to understand healthy boundaries, healthy relationships, what love really can look like. And a lot of this just comes with time and with um, mentorship and being, you know, taught something different, right? So many, so many of them have to unlearn what has been poured into them, sometimes their entire life. And so those are a lot of the therapeutic pieces that are needed. But for survivors to find empowerment, where we see the most, you know, there's healing and then there's empowerment. And so the things that we find are the most empowering are discovering who they are, what they like, what they want to do when they grow up, if it's a child, what they're good at. You know, all they've ever been told is that they are a commodity, that they have no value, that they have no skill, and the only thing that they can do is sex. And so for them to learn that they're really good at painting or that they're a powerhouse writer or that they, um, want to actually work in the psychology field and they want to serve survivors those are the things that just turn their brains on and when they have that focus in front of them nothing can stop them and so education is so critically important and economic empowerment giving them the ability to make money in a way that is healthy and so many of them have never had that opportunity and so when you put that opportunity in front of them and you say, this is how much, this is what you're doing and this is how much you can earn and they realize that the sky is the limit, that they can do what they want at some level, they can work the number of hours that they want and make that money and they get to keep it for themselves and they don't have a trafficker taking it from them. It's so exciting. We have a survivor on staff the other day who um, sent us a message and she goes, oh, I'm so hungry. I need to go and get something to eat. And then she sent another message and goes, oh, I just realized I am a free thinking adult. I have an income <laughs> and I have a car and I'm going to get Taco wow. Bell. And it was so funny. Yeah. But just to see the fact that she had the ability to wow. make that decision. She had money. She had a car. She had the ability to make a decision. And she was going for her Taco Bell and that was the thing that sounded good for her. So... But that's the thing that just makes them so excited. And then once they have that in their grasp, again, nothing stops them. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that cool experience. That, that does show that the simplicity that we take for granted as a person who hasn't experienced the life of sex trafficking, those things that we take for granted, man, those are the most beautiful parts. Yeah, absolutely. Of, of that change, of that process of change. But you have a map on your website that shows that you have four states with fully operating programs. You have four states with partially operating programs, two states ready to open, and nine states with a mentor program. And I can't help but think about the huge operating budget that is needed mm -hmm. to fulfill all of these needs. Absolutely. Man, I just, I just think it's important to acknowledge that this, this requires all hands on deck. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We have an audacious goal on our website, and it says that our, our goal is to see child trafficking eradicated by 2030. And we always tell people, please understand, that is not a statement of us and what we're here saying we can do on our own. That is a battle cry. That is a exactly what you said. That is, this is an all hands on deck issue. And if all of us turn our attention to it, 
that absolutely we could see it done. We can do it. We just have to decide that we want to. Yeah. Um, I think this is a good time to plug your donate page. Um, <laughs> yes. Because I know, like I mentioned, the big operating budget that's required for all of the things that you're doing. Um, and I just want to encourage those who want to to go to safehouseproject.org forward slash donate. And um, you can help out in that way. As we're kind of coming to the conclusion of this conversation, Christy, are there any questions that I should have asked but didn't? Oh, goodness. Or anything that's um, stirring inside you that you would like to share? I think the thing that is important to know is that, I mean, as dark as this issue is, there's hope. You know, and that's the thing. So many people look at this issue and go, oh, God, that's just, mm -mm, I can't touch it because it's just so big. It's so dark. It's so scary. And the reason we keep going and keep doing what we do is because we've seen where hope can be brought in. And if we decided, put our attention towards the hope side of this and the healing side of this, rather than the sometimes over-sensationalized Hollywood version of it, then we actually can make a dent. If our goal every day is to bring one degree more of sunshine and services to survivors, then we can start making a difference. And um, I think that's the, the thing that keeps us all going, is knowing that you know, we get to see survivors exit their trafficking situation, go into restorative care, get a degree, get out, get a job, you know, go into serving this industry or go on to do something else with their life that has absolutely nothing to do with trafficking. Yeah. And every single one of those that we get to serve in that capacity is another one of those starfish. Exactly. And those are women who are changing the world. Yep. One more starfish. I love it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much for having us on. Yeah, we appreciate it. Thanks for joining us today. Regardless of age, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, religious affiliation, political persuasion, or any other diversifying factor, porn can impact anyone. If you've recognized the harmful effects of pornography in your life, or recognize the harms pornography can cause on society, we welcome you to become a fighter. As fighters, we strive to be bold, understanding, open-minded, and accepting. If you're ready to become an official fighter, we invite you to join the movement at ftnd.org forward slash fighter. That's ftnd.org forward slash F-I-G-H-T-E-R. Join us in our fight for love by becoming a fighter today. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Consider Before Consuming. Consider Before Consuming is brought to you by Fight the New Drug. Fight the New Drug is a non-religious and non-legislative organization that exists to provide individuals the opportunity to make an informed decision regarding pornography by raising awareness on its harmful effects using only science, facts, and personal accounts. If you want to learn more about today's guest and the conversation we had, you can check out the links included with this episode. Again, big thanks to you for listening to this conversation. As you go about your day, we invite you to increase your self-awareness, look both ways, check your blind spots, and consider before consuming.